and your desire in 2016 that God would draw you closer to Him. Because no one else will do Nothing else will do He is the only one that will never, ever let us go. The question, though, that I've had to ask myself this week, but I'm going to ask you this morning, is if there is someone or something that is keeping you from making sure that God has top place, top priority in your life, are you willing to let it go? Are you willing to let them go? Or are you willing for God to take it away? You know, when we think about job and family and all that, those are things that we get comfortable in and we don't want to let go. But if anything takes the place of God, He has the right to take it away. Are we willing? You know, as we look at 2016, maybe you're real excited that January the 1st came because 2015 is a year you'd like to forget. There were problems, there were struggles, there was sickness, there were all kinds of things that maybe happened and you're ready to be done with 2015. And you're looking forward to 2016. But my prayer is that God would allow me to go through whatever pain, whatever problems, whatever struggle He needs me to go through in 2016 so that I might become more and more like His Son. Turn with me to the book of Genesis. To begin, I want to read out of Genesis chapter 50. We'll be looking at several different verses and chapters. If you do not have a copy of God's Word with you this morning, we have some. You could just raise your hand. We have someone that would bring it to you. If anybody does not have a copy of God's Word, just raise your hand. If anybody doesn't have notes or a pen. Can't write if you don't have a pen. Once you found Genesis chapter 50, I'm going to ask you that you please stand. In honor of the reading of God's Word. This morning we're going to look at Joseph. But to get us started, I want to read the very end of Joseph's life. And then we'll go back and see what led up to this point. Genesis chapter 50, beginning in verse 22. Now Joseph stayed in Egypt. He and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons. Also the sons of Bukur, the son of Manasseh, were born on Joseph's knees. Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die. But God will surely take care of you. And he will bring you up from this land to the land which he promised on oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you. Father, thank you. That, Lord, we sing that you're all we need. But, Father, thank you that we can understand you are enough. We need nothing else. And, Father, thank you that when we're in the valley, when we're in the rough times, you're there. Father, we also thank you that when we're on the mountaintop and when things are going well, you're there. Father, help us to draw closer to you. Father, use us. Change us. For it's in the precious and holy name of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ we ask it. Amen. This morning we're going to look at the life of Joseph. And we're going to begin to see how God used him and hopefully how God can use you and me. First of all, I want us just to go through a little family history. Before I get into some of Joseph's family history, let me 
Just say this. Joseph came from a dysfunctional family. I just use that term because you hear it in our world today, right? Well, let me break the news to you. Every one of us came from a dysfunctional family. And we're going to look at that. <laughs> but let's look, just look at Joseph's history. His father lied to his father. Jacob deceived his dad. He stole the birthright from his brother Esau. But it wasn't just Jacob that participated. Guess what? Joseph's grandmother was a part. Let that bless you. How many of you want to think your grandmother would be a part of lying to somebody? But guess what? The reason we're all from dysfunctional families is we're all sinners. I don't know about, well, I do know about you, but I'll just speak for myself. I'm a liar. And you are too. At some point in our lives, we do. Joseph was a part of that. Notice his father was also deceived by his father-in-law. Remember Jacob? He wanted to marry Rachel. So he went to Laban, and he said, what do I have to do? Laban said, hey, bud, I've had to work for me for seven years. By the way, do I get an amen for me? Dad's in the house of like their son, future son-in-law to work for them for seven years? Yeah, yeah there we go. <laughs> and so, once Jacob did, then what happened? Did he get Rachel? Oh, yeah. No. <laughs> he got Leah. And so then, Laban said, hey, another seven years. Then you can have her. So then, not only that, but his mom didn't trust God. Rachel was not able to have kids. And so instead of waiting on God's time, she took her servant and said, you go in and bear children. So she gave her servant to her husband. Then when Rachel was giving birth to Joseph's younger brother, Benjamin, what happened? She died. And then Joseph was favored by his father, which meant he was hated by all his brothers. A dysfunctional family. But if I ask you to come up here and to share your family history, <laughs> it wouldn't be real good either, would it? But here's something that we got to understand about this family, though, folks. This was a family that was God-honoring and God-fearing. This was not a pagan family. This would be a family in today's world where they were teaching small groups, they were teaching Sunday school, they were leading in worship, they were singing in the choir. This is the family we're talking about. Yet they were still sinners. What's that say about you and me? We're still sinners. But aren't you glad that's not worth the story you <laughs> I want us to move forward and I want us to look at the progressive sanctification that took place in the life of Joseph. Just to make sure you understand what sanctification is, I've given you a little definition. It's set apart from sin to holiness. It is God working in our life through struggles, through trials, through temptation, in the good times and the bad times. To mold us and make us more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. I want you to look at the chart. As we go through, first of all, we have to begin with regeneration. You and I can't be sanctified if we're not saved. But as we go, notice, things start going well, then there may be a little fall. You know, maybe it's something that happens, lose a job or something. But then we have real good times. Then we also have the bad times. Maybe a loss of someone. There's times that we fall away from God. We don't trust Him like we should. We don't follow Him like we should. Maybe this chart reflects all of 2015 for you. Maybe it's nothing but a bunch of ups and downs. But we can never forget the ultimate goal is what? Glorification. That home with our Heavenly Father. Which, by the way, there won't be any sin. We serve a holy God that cannot allow sin to his heaven. And so at that day, we will be perfect. So here, Joseph, 
He was 17 years old when Joseph was sent out to his brothers to watch them as they were tending sheep. And if you look in chapter 37, it says that Joseph came back with a bad report about his brothers. In other words, he was just a little teenage tattoo. Have you ever experienced that in your family? Mm -hmm. Joseph came back and he gave the bad report. So then it comes a time and his dad says, I need you to go out to them and they're in Shechem. So Joseph starts, he gets to Shechem and guess what? His brothers aren't there. So he starts asking around where they are and someone tells him they've gone to Dothan. You say, what in the world does that have to do with anything? Well, you have to understand. Shechem was over here. Dothan was to the west over here. Where Dothan sat, there was a trade route that went. And so the reason that they were in Dothan is because Joseph had to go to Dothan so that then when the time came, he could be told, sold to the Ishmaelites who were traveling that road. I tell you that just to say this. The reason they were in Dothan is it was part of God's plan. Amen. And here's what I mean by that. Folks, God will move you and me, if necessary, for his plan. Yes. <coughs> and he'll move others that don't even understand it, like his brothers. So, Joseph's coming, and remember he had the big coat in many colors. I mean, that would you not have trouble... I mean, let's think about this. Joseph had all the brothers. His dad and four women lived in the house with all the kids. That in and of itself would cause a little problem. <laughs> but he had this coat of many colors, and as he's coming from afar off, his brothers see him. And they're like, all right, it's our baby brother, yeah. Right? <laughs> no, no. They're like, hey, here comes that boy. That one. Let's kill him. And the one brother said, no, let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in a pit. I was just thinking about it earlier. Here's the good news. When you and I are thrown in a pit, guess what? I say, how do you know that, Brian? Well, do you remember when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace? What happened? When they looked in, there wasn't three, there was four. <laughs> because God was there. When you and I get thrown in a pit, He's there. And the best news is, when we climb out of the pit, He's there too. Joseph was thrown into the pit, He was sold to the Ishmaelites. As Joseph was, as they threatened to kill him, as they threw him into the pit, God protected him. Then as he was sold to the Ishmaelites, remember I told you it was part of God's plan. Then the Ishmaelites, they sold him to Potiphar. So he goes to Egypt, and I want you to turn to chapter 39. Chapter 39 of Genesis, beginning in verse 1, it says, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph. So he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. His master saw the Lord was with him and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. Notice here, the Lord was with Joseph. But there's a second part. Others around him noticed the Lord was with him. When God is truly changing us and helping us grow, others around us have to notice. They have to. And it's not us they notice. It's God living in and through us. Then, he's in Potiphar's house, and what happens? You look at verse 7, well, in verse 6, going in verse 7, it says that Joseph was a handsome man. Potiphar's wife noticed. She took some interest in him. She began to tempt him. 
Joseph resisted. So then one day she thought, all right, I got a plan. She made sure nobody else was there. And then she really went after Joseph. And as she reached out and grabbed his coat, what did Joseph do? Are we not told to flee temptation? He ran. He left his coat. And so Potiphar's wife was embarrassed. And so she thought, okay, I'll get him. So she decided she would lie about him. She started making up the story. She started telling him. And if you look over in the end of uh, verse 18 of chapter 39, it says, And as I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. Verse 19 said, Now when his master heard the words of his wife, when she spoke to him, saying, This is what your slave did to me, his anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him in the jail. So Potiphar's wife accuses him. She tells her husband. But here's the part I want you to notice in here. What was Joseph's response? It says she accused him. It says Potiphar was told anger burned within him and he threw him into jail. What was Joseph's response in all of this? Absolutely nothing. Hear me, folks. There's times you and I will be accused. There's times people will bring charges against us, and it is not our job to defend ourselves. The Lord is our defense. He will take care of us. Look at this. Joseph knew that the end result, if he didn't say anything, he knew what was going to happen. He knew he was going to prison. He was trusting God. Because he was on that road. He was growing. And you and I are to a point where we don't try and defend ourselves. Because a lot of times that's quickly what we do. Isn't it? Somebody comes and lies about us, what's our normal response? We're going to fix it. It's not our job to testify. It's not our job to pull in any other witnesses because we got the only witness we need. God the Father. But hear me, folks. Sometimes part of his plan may not be our plan. Do you think Joseph wanted to go to prison? I mean, if we took a survey in here today, I don't think that anybody in here is going to be standing up, walking out the door saying, all right, I'm ready to go to prison. Take me now. But here's what Joseph did know. Whether he was in Potiphar's house or whether he was in jail, the Lord was with him. Look at verse 21. Joseph has been thrown in jail and says, But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. What was the big difference in Joseph? People could see the Lord was with him. What is it that people have to see in you and me? They must see the Lord is with us. It's got to make a difference. So Joseph's in jail. The baker and cupbearer come. They're thrown into prison. They have some dreams. Joseph interprets it. He tells them what's going to happen. What's he tell the baker? He tells the baker that it's going to come where he doesn't have a head. He tells the cupbearer he's going to be restored to his position. And then what's he say to the cupbearer? He says, when you're restored, don't forget me. Here's something that I, that I got from that, from that part, folks. The Lord had been with Joseph and been with Joseph. But when it came time he interpreted the cupbearer's dream, Joseph all of a sudden changed his trust from God and he put it into a human being. Because he told the cupbearer to remember him. Do we not do the same thing at times? So? If we look back over 2015 or even beyond that, we can see how the Lord is faithful, how the Lord has been with us. But then at times, the old flesh 
begins to rear itself up, and for whatever reason, it's not trusting you God. Did he not create everything? Did God not create it all? Does he not know every single thing about you and me? He knows what we're made of. He created us and formed us in our mother's womb. He knows every hair on our head. But still the flesh in us sometimes just won't trust him. All knowing, all powerful. But for whatever reason we think, hmm, God just, just get over. I got this. I don't need you. And what happens every time we do that? We fall flat on our face. I, went, I wrote it on here this week. Go and read Psalm 146. It gives a great description of the difference in putting our faith and trust in a human being or putting our faith and trust in God. So now then after this, then Pharaoh has a dream. Nobody can interpret his. And all of a sudden, the cupbearer has a memory. And he remembers there was somebody when he was in jail that interpreted his dream. And so he told Pharaoh, he said, hey, I got a guy for you. So Joseph comes and he interprets Pharaoh's dream. And now he's put in a prominent position. He's number two in charge behind Pharaoh. And somebody mentioned this to me after the first service, and I didn't think about it. But they said, think about this. How do you think Potiphar felt after Joseph was put second in charge? He's probably thinking, I sure hope that what my wife said was true, because if not, and don't, if I'd been Joseph, I'd have said, hey, I need to meet with Potiphar. <laughs> <laughs> Just have him come to my office. <laughs> and then I probably wouldn't have said a word. I'd have just let him sit there. But he goes to this prominent position. But I want you to understand this. Don't miss this, folks. Joseph was placed in this prominent position not for anything with Joseph. Had absolutely nothing to do with Joseph. Joseph was placed in that position for one reason. And that was to preserve life. Hold on to that because we're going to come back to it in a minute. Then we have the family reconciliation. As Joseph has been in Egypt and all this is going on, his brothers are still back there tending sheep. And so all of a sudden a famine comes. And Jacob looks at the boys and he says, y'all need to go to Egypt and get us some food. Well, you think about it, it was about a 275 to 300 mile journey. Now we might think about that in today. You know, we don't necessarily like to drive that, but getting in a car, driving 275, 300 miles, not that big a deal. Well, if you get nothing else from the sermon today, get this. They didn't have cars back then. <laughs> you can write that in back. And so this journey would have taken them about six weeks. <coughs> that will bless you. Travel with your family for six weeks. <laughs> I said, really, after Christmas, I mean, come on. You got to spend a little time? Wouldn't that bless you? But they travel there. They come to Egypt. When they get there and stand before Joseph, the Bible tells us immediately Joseph recognized them. They didn't recognize him. Why? He was Egyptian now. He looked like an Egyptian. He didn't look the same. But Joseph recognized them. He began to speak harshly to them. He was kind of seeing where they were. But one thing that the scripture doesn't tell us, but that we can see because of this, is all this time, all these years that were passing as this was going on, Joseph was being worked on by the Heavenly Father to get him to a place where he could reconcile with his brothers. Sometimes we want reconciliation to happen immediately, right? Some of you may be sitting here this morning and you have family you haven't talked to in 20 years. I'm not going to tell you that if you leave here this morning and you pick up the phone and call them, that everything's going to be reconciled and everything's going to be fine. But I will tell you this. If you're a child of God, you have a responsibility to try and reconcile with your fellow man. Amen. You say, they hurt me. Joseph was hurt. They threw him in a pit. 
because my father was hurt. And his son was the cross. So Joseph, he gives them the grain, and he says, all right, leave one here. So he kept Simeon, but he put the money back in their sacks. So they're traveling back home. What do you think that little meeting was like when they're traveling home and all of a sudden they find the money? I just got to think of it being a six-week six journey all the way back, that when that happened, there's a little finger pointing going on. Brother blaming brother and all this. They go back. And they get to their father, and jo uh, Joseph had asked them to bring one person with them when they come back. Who was that? Benjamin, his brother. They have a long talk with dad. Dad's not cool. Because he's thinking, I've already lost one, and now I just don't want to lose another. But finally, they convince him the brothers return. And when they come and stand before, and Joseph sees Benjamin, his baby brother. What does he do? He has compassion on him. He falls on him and he begins to hug him and kiss him. Remember, Benjamin was the one brother that wasn't involved in throwing him in the pit. But he begins to feel love and compassion. But he wants to see what's going on with the other, with the other ten. He wants to check them out. So he begins to put them to a test, and you can read about it in chapter 44, as he begins to test the brothers and see, he puts the cup in there, but I want you to turn to chapter 45, because as Joseph is doing this, Joseph is, is waiting to see if his brothers are at a point for reconciliation, but in chapter 45, verse 1, it says, Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried, Have everyone go out for me. So there was no man with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. He wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard it, and the household of Pharaoh heard of it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers <clears throat> could not answer him, for they were dismayed at his presence. How do I know that God had been working in the life of Joseph to bring him to the point of reconciliation? Because at this point, Joseph does not do any harm or anything to his brothers. He simply reveals himself. And when he does, they're scared to death. Because they don't know what's about to happen because he says that he's their brother, the one that they sold into slavery, and they're thinking, he's number two. He's second in charge. He can do to us whatever he wants. <laughs> but verse 4, Joseph said to his brothers, please come closer. One thing you've got to understand here is as Joseph asked them to come closer, an Egyptian would never ask a Hebrew to come closer. Back in this day, they never would have asked. Joseph said, Draw, come closer to me. And they came closer and he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Why did Joseph have them come closer? Because the closer they got, they would be able to recognize and begin to look at him and know that is our brother. Folks, you and I need to draw close enough to God that we can see he's our King of Kings. He's our Lord of Lords. He's our Savior. He's the one that gave his life on the cross for you and me. He says... Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. But underline this. For God sent me here to preserve life. And that leads us into the main part. The reason I give you all this history and talk about Joseph is for us to see Joseph as a picture of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of similarities between the two. First of all, I mentioned that Joseph and all of us came from dysfunctional families. Guess what? So did Jesus. Go to Matthew chapter 1. Read the first 17 verses and have fun with all the names. But as you go through that and you begin to study, you'll find out that there's one name that was a worshiper of idols. It also talks about David and Bathsheba who committed adultery. It also talks about Rahab who was a prostitute. 
Why do we have the genealogy of Jesus Christ? So that we can understand. Jesus Christ came and was just like you and me. And he lived on this earth. But the one difference is he was perfect and sinless. And he was able to be the sacrifice that you and I could not do. But they both had dysfunctional families. They both were beloved by their fathers. They both were obedient to their fathers. They both were tempted. Jesus Christ was tempted in the desert. Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife. They both were hated and rejected by their own brothers, their own family. You don't have to understand that and you have to realize when you and I trust in Jesus Christ, our family may not support it, folks. They may hate us, they may reject us. But we're not here to please our family. We're here to please God. They both were sold as slaves. They both met the physical needs of others. Joseph, by being placed in charge, he was the one giving out all the food during the famine. Jesus Christ came, and he gave people bread, but he also said, I'm the bread of life. They both were falsely accused and unjustly punished. They both were arrested. Both were elevated to power. But catch this last one. They both forgave those that wronged them. <clears throat> Joseph forgave his brothers. But Jesus Christ took it even a step further. Because <coughs> he hung on the cross in agony and pain. They had beaten him. They had placed a crown of thorns. They had driven the spikes in him. Yet he mustered up enough strength and enough air to simply say, Father, forgive them. So they don't have a clue what they're doing. How was Joseph able to forgive was it because of Joseph? Was it because of things he did? No. It was all because of God. How can you and I forgive those that have wronged us? It's only through the power of Almighty God. You may be sitting here this morning and you've not been able to forgive somebody that wronged you. The reason is you keep trying to do it on your own. Why do we need to forgive? Because we were forgiven. <laughs> And the part I just mentioned, that part I read, they both were here to preserve life. Joseph did it by living. Jesus did it by dying. So you say, well, what's the point of all this? Well, let's look at the application. As we head into 2016, a few things we need to understand and a few things we need to come to grips with. First thing I want us to get from Joseph's life is notice that Joseph expected God to work. So it's pretty simple to take that into you and I must expect God to work. You look back at 15 and maybe you have trouble finding areas that God was at work in. Maybe you think of 2015 as it was, it was a lot of the low points. Well, just remember, the same God of 2015 is the God of 2016. The same God on the mountain is the same God in the valley. He never changes. I, the Lord your God, do not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Second, Reconciliation between Joseph and his brothers was possible only because Joseph had suffered and had triumphed. You and I can only reconcile with God through Jesus Christ, who, by the way, had to suffer and then triumph. We look at it as the cross is where he suffered. <coughs> But then the resurrection, Billy talked about it earlier. He's not on the cross anymore, folks. But guess what? He's not in the tomb anymore either. What separates us from all other religions out there? We serve a living God. He's alive. 
So with the cross and with the resurrection, we can have reconciliation. Third, Joseph was enabled by God's grace to wipe out the pains and bad memories of the past and to make a new beginning. Maybe you're like a lot of people that you couldn't wait for January the 1st, 2016 to come because you just wanted to be done with 2015. You didn't want to remember any of it. You didn't want to go through it. Maybe it was a loss of job. Maybe it was a loss of life, a family member or someone. Maybe a loss of a house. But whatever struggles, whatever trials and tribulations that you went through, you just want to forget about it. And you want to start new. Well, hear me, you and I can only do it by God's grace. And we've got to get past it because if we do not, then we allow those things to become bitter, cause us to become bitter. You and I have a choice. We can be bitter or we can be better. It's our choice. The only way we can become better is by God's grace. So you and I, four of us, frequently take off the old hurts and pains and put on a new attitude of faith and love. Here's the faith part that really gets us. Is we have to have faith in God when it doesn't feel good for us. When it's not our plan. When it really hurts. When it's really a struggle. We have to have the faith in Him. He's always been faithful. And he knows what's best for us. Even as a parent, I have to come to the understanding that I don't know what's best for my kids. But thanks be to God, I got a Heavenly Father that does. And even when I'm not faithful to them, he is. Even when I'm not a good father, he is. Joseph had two sons. And I mention this because their names are very important. First was Manasseh. And Manasseh means forgetting. Joseph named him Manasseh because he wanted to forget all the past and all the things that had gone on. And his second son was Ephraim. And Ephraim literally means twice fruitful. You and I can be forgetting and fruitful. We can get past the things that have hurt us and the pain that has come, and we can allow God to cause us to be fruitful. That's what Billy was talking about last week when he talked about being a, a light that shines. We've talked about it. We live in a dark, sinful world. Amen? If you don't believe me, just turn on the news. And so because the world is dark, anytime you and I shine a light, it will be noticed. It's no different than at your house. If you walk in your house and it's totally dark, you cut on the light, and guess what? Now you can see. All you got to do is flip the switch. In order for you and I to be fruitful, we have to forget the past and get past all those bitter hurts. We've got to flip the switch. Shine the light. And begin to be fruitful. But here's the question. And this is the question I've had to answer all week. Are we willing? To lay down whatever it is. That's preventing us. From allowing God to have first place in us. Are we willing to hurt? Are we willing to suffer? Doesn't sound real good, does it? But know this. The end is glorification. When we're home with our Heavenly Father, we don't have to worry anymore because there's not going to be any more pain. There's not going to be any more sorrow. There's not going to be any more suffering. It'll all be over and it'll all be worth it. So if that's what it takes, you and I have to be willing to go through it. Be thrown in a pit if necessary. 
thrown into prison, to be hated by our brothers. <coughs> Whatever it takes. So that we can become less. He can become more. Are you willing to go through that? And as I said, understand, I'm not asking you this question. It hasn't been asked to me by him all week. Are you willing to let go of family if that's what it takes? Are you willing to let go of a job if that's what it takes? You know, sometimes when we lose a job, we think, man, I just don't know what I'm going to do. Don't find out a lot of times we get a better job. Notice I didn't say more money. But maybe we get better co-workers. We get in a better situation. Chris talked about it just a minute ago. He is with us as we go through the fire. The good thing about going through it is we do get to come out on the other side. We don't have to stay in it. Are we willing? Father, thank you. Lord, I thank you for my struggles, my pain, my problems, the tribulations that I went through in 2015. Because I realized that it's you molding and making me more into the image of your son. And Lord, I pray that whatever it takes in 2016 for you to mold and make me more into the image of your son, Lord, I'm willing to go through it. And Father, I know that you will be right there with me. Father, maybe there's some here this morning that they need to get past those struggles and things. They need to get rid of that root of bitterness in them. Maybe they need to come and lay it down here at the altar. Father, maybe there's some that need to come and thank you for the trials and tribulations that they've gone through because it's drawn them closer to you and it's made them more like Jesus Christ. Father, maybe there's some here they understand nothing about progressive sanctification because they've never been regenerated. They talk about it. They know your word. They know what it says. They know all about you, but you don't know them. Father, speak to us. Father, help us to learn through these trials and tribulations. Father, help us to change so that we might grow. Father, we love you. We thank you that you love us. Father, thank you that you never give up. Precious.